Welcome back, everyone, to the series Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles. <clears throat> Coming to you today from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and from Oxford University in Oxford, U.K., and from the United Nations in New York City. This is the final episode of our series this term, which explores how multidimensional metrics are changing the world. I'm James Foster, Vice Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University, representing the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, uh, in today's uh, session. I'm here with Sabina Alcar, who will be a bit quieter today, and her colleague, Ricardo Nogales. Sabina is uh, director of the Oxford Poverty and Human, uh, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI. Uh, uh, and along with our colleagues at the Human Development Report Office uh, of the UNDP, we're really proud to offer today's presentation, Distributional Impacts of Cash Transfers on the Multidimensional Poverty of Refugees, the ESSN program in Turkey, presented by Matthew Robson of OFI, with a discussion by Josephine Passanen of HDRO with additional questions by you, the audience. In just a moment, I'll ask uh, Ricardo to describe the series and introduce the other three speakers, other few speakers, but uh, uh, <laughs> golly, uh, I'd like to express my appreciation first though to the team uh, at OFI, the whole team, uh, Jacob Dirksen, Ricardo Nogales, Emmeline Marcelin, uh, the whole crew for lining up a wonderful series this term. And of course, to our colleagues at H HDRO as well. Uh, as always, I wanted to just uh, put a special thanks in for Kyle Renner and his team at IAP for facilitating the discussion. IAP actually has many events this week, including tomorrow's trade and development seminar by Bruno Conti uh, entitled Climate Change and Migration, the Case of Africa. And on Thursday, it will host, along with the World Bank, a morning conference on economic effects and policy responses to climate change and natural disasters. Have a look on the website for those two events. And then finally, on Friday, Bo Sun of the Federal Reserve will present US-China Hostility, quite an intriguing title, if I would say, in our 14th annual China conference series. As I said, for these and other events, look at the website iiep.gwu.edu. And if you have to miss an event, you can catch it online on the YouTube channel IIEPGW. Now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Ricardo for the remarks. Go ahead, Ricardo. Thank you very much, James. And uh, thank you, everyone. I reiterate on behalf of OFI uh, our thanks for holding this uh, very exciting and very insightful uh, series, series of seminars where we have learned so much. We have discussed in depth the very interesting issues. And it's hard to believe that actually uh, this is the last one and we're coming to an end. I really hope that uh, you have enjoyed the audience, all the presentations that have preceded this one. And it is actually a very special pleasure to have uh, uh, Matthew closing this, this seminar series because Matthew has been with us uh, in office since 2014. He's been a researcher uh, on many aspects and many fronts of our work. He's worked on uh, refugee multidimensional poverty indices, on mismatches between monetary and multidimensional poverty, as well as analysis of changes over time when it comes to multidimensional poverty. Uh, this is because he uh, has a very strong background when it comes to working with health and inequality. Uh, and that is reflected on the fact that currently Matthew is a research fellow at the University of York, where he obtained his PhD in economics. And uh, he's working within the equity and health policy team, the Equipol team, uh, to develop methods to evaluate causal impact of interventions, especially focused on health inequalities. And uh, his interests span a lot of um, fields, including experimental and behavioral economics where he basically focuses on uh, pro-social behavior and inequality aversion. So I think that listening uh, to Matthew's presentation about the impact evaluation of this uh, program in Turkey is gonna be very enlightening. So thank you very much again to the audience. Thank you to the GW uh, and James in particular, his team and everybody at uh, HDRO for making this possible. And with that, 
thank you very much. Over to you, James, for uh, kicking off the last uh, presentation. Great. Well, I'll turn it directly over to, to Matthew. Run with it. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and share my screen now. Let me see. Can everybody see that now? Yeah, great. Okay. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you for the kind introductions. Um, it's great to be able to present. Um, so this, this paper is um, a joint uh, paper between was it OFI and the World Food Programme in Turkey. Um, so that the paper is on distributional impacts of cash transfers on the multidimensional poverty of refugees and um, focusing on the ESSN programme in Turkey. <clears throat> so the motivation for this paper is that cash transfer programmes are increasingly being used for poverty reduction for social protection, and more recently in humanitarian contexts. So whilst the impact of cash transfers on individual outcomes, such as income or education, are well understood, researchers are increasingly trying to estimate the impacts on multiple outcomes simultaneously, primarily by using a multidimensional poverty lens. Now, while the effectiveness of cash transfers are being found in these poverty and social protection contexts, the impacts of these programs on multiple simultaneous equation uh, outcomes in humanitarian contexts are still not well understood. So to study such impacts, we're going to focus on the Emergency Social Safety Net, the, or the ESSN program, which was launched in Turkey in 2016 in response to the influx of mostly Syrian refugees who are fleeing to Turkey in the wake of the Syrian civil war. So the ESSN is currently the largest humanitarian cash transfer program in the world, providing monthly unconditional cash transfers to over 1.8 million refugees. And while previous evaluation exercises have looked at a range of intended outcomes of the program separately, what we're doing here is to estimate the impact on multidimensional poverty itself. In order to do so, we've developed a tailored refugee multidimensional poverty index, we've called the RMPI, using the Algar Foster method. We use this to evaluate the impact of ESSN on multidimensional poverty of refugees in Turkey. We utilize and develop advanced econometric methods, which the main, process of, the main aim of these is to go beyond estimating average treatment effects and to put focus on the entire distribution of the outcome. And crucially, we're using this in conjunction um, with the RMPI in order to estimate the distributional effects on both the incidence and intensity of multidimensional poverty. Very briefly on the literature, we, we draw on, on two main parts of the literature. The first is quite recent work um, on applying multidimensional poverty to impact evaluations. So we split these into three types of MPI that are being used, a programmatic MPI, a global MPI, and a population MPI. So the first of these categories, these authors are primarily looked at the intended outcomes of these particular programs and they've constructed and they've used indicators to construct an MPI specific to that program and then evaluated the impact of the program on uh, these multiple intended outcomes simultaneously. An alternative approach um, is to use the global MPI, so the globally recognized MPI with its set um, indicators and identify if a program has an impact on that global MPI. I think the trade-offs between these two are that a global MPI might not be precise enough to get at the intended outcomes of a program, while a downside of programmatic is it might not be externally um, valid or may indeed choose particular types of um, outcomes which were expected to change in the first place. An alternative is to look at a population MPI, and it's kind of in between the two. So this, this focuses on a particular population, um, as Loshman, Patton and Seigel did um, on refugees, to create an MPI which is more specific um, and intended to be for that population, but not um, as a programmatic MPI is to do specifically aimed at um, particular outcomes of an intervention. So that's where we're kind of standing here, a population MPI, rather than a global or a programmatic. Now, across most of these um, measures, the primary focus is on um, average treatment effects of this in interesting measure of MPI. 
In the treatment effects literature, it's a very wide literature, um, and it begins with the, the Rubin paper in 1974. The, the primary aim of that paper was, was indeed to look at average treatment effects, but mainly on univariate outcomes, not on the, not on the multidimensional outcomes that we've seen before. There has, however, been a large move in the literature to go beyond estimating average treatment effects. While still primarily focused on the univariate outcomes, I think there's a lot to be learned from this literature. So first, kind of conditional average treatment effects look at heterogeneity and effects of programs between different types of people, so conditioning and observable characteristics. Quantile treatment effects and distributional treatment effects look at how the distribution of the outcome is changing. And inequality treatment effects look at how summary measures of inequality, such as a Gini or a um, Atkinson index, are changing as a result of the program. So what we're trying to do here is to kind of combine the two benefits of the two, using kind of a multidimensional poverty measure, as these have done, to get multiple simultaneous deprivations, but also extend beyond these average treatment effects towards the quantile and distributional effects. Um, so in sum, we contributed to the literature by developing a refugee multidimensional poverty index, allowing for the measurement of the incidence and intensity of poverty amongst refugees. We utilize and develop advanced econometric methods, which in combination with this purposeful index allow us to go beyond the mean and estimate treatment effects across the entire distribution of deprivation. And crucially, we use these methods to evaluate, evaluate the impact of the world's largest humanitarian cash transfer program on the multidimensional poverty of refugees. So as a brief outline of the talk, I'm gonna very briefly talk about the data we have. I'll then spend a bit of time on the RMPI that we've developed um, and some, some summary statistics surrounding that. After that, I'll go on to the ESSN and show the impacts of the ESSN on the RMPI before I'll conclude. So in terms of data, what we use is the Comprehensive Vulnerability Monitoring Exercise, the CVME. So this is a cross-sectional survey collected across five waves, which provides in-depth information on the determinants of refugee vulnerability in Turkey. We only use waves three to five in the study, um, and they were taken between March 2018 and February 2020. The reason we don't use waves one and two is because of the sampling, um, and it's only in waves three to five that the sample is representative of refugees at the national level. This leaves us with a sample size of 4,106 households. And importantly, for the later work that I'll show on the ESSN, this includes both applicants who are eligible and ineligible, alongside non-applicants, which other data sources don't have. Um, so it's an important part of this data to include both these applicants and non-applicants to be representative of refugees at the national level. Now, in terms of the RMPI that we've developed, so this is the work is primarily done by Frank, my co-author, um, in combination with people at World Food Programme. Um, and with a lot of discussion, with a lot of trial measures, we've arrived at this uh, refugee multidimensional poverty index. And this is particularly appropriate for the refugee situation in Turkey and does depend on the data that we've had available. So we have the education, health and living standards um, dimensions that the global MPI does. But we also added in a food security and income resources dimensions because these are particularly important in the refugee context um, in Turkey. In terms of education, um, the indicators we have the school attendance um, and the highest education of the household head. For health, we have illness. Um, if more than half the household members were reported sick and a treatment variable looking if any members are tre not treated when sick. In terms of food security, um, we have uh, a lot of data here gathered by the World Food Programme, particularly on consumption. So this is where we have a coping strategy index related to food security. Um, and we also have a dietary diversity score looking at the range of foods that um, refugees are eating in the household. Income resources are also important. We have precarious work where members of the household are begged or engaged in illegal or high risk work. We also have a no income variable where no household member has worked within the last 30 days. In terms of living standards, we have data on overcrowding, sanitation, 
and winter assets, which are really important in Turkey, um, and hygiene. So together, these variables form what we have as a population MPI, um, particularly suited to the refugee context in Turkey. I won't spend too much data detail on, on the stats because I know you guys um, are experts in this. Um, so the first, I'm just going to draw attention. I'm, a lot of what I'm doing is focusing on the individual measures of deprivation and poverty. So a lot of it is kind of subscripted I, the, the deprivation score of an individual um, as a weighted sum of all the indicators they're deprived in. Um, an individual class is poor if they, their um, deprivation score is greater than or equal to a certain cutoff threshold. Um, and we have our usual standard summary measures of MPI, the headcount ratio, the proportion of the population classed as poor, and the intensity um, of the deprivation amongst those who are poor, and the RMPI. So a summary stats for this population, when we use a 20% cutoff threshold, we find that 50% of the population are classed as multidimensionally poor. In terms of intensity, um, this is 28.7. So of those who are poor, the average um, number of the average report, uh, percentage of these indicators that are deprived in is just over a quarter, and the MPI is 0.14. Now, a lot of what we've been interested in is not just the summary stats, but the distribution of deprivation and how the headcounts change according to the threshold chosen. So on the left, you see a probability mass function, which is kind of like a histogram. And each of these bars um, is for every possible level of deprivation that we see. So from 0 to 1, in increments of 0 0.05. Um, for example, we see with 0, an individual has um, is deprived in no indicators. In 1, they're deprived in all. More than 15% are deprived in no deprivation, in no indicators and no individuals are deprived in all. We have a modal point around 0.15, um, and we see this tail rapidly shoots down as we get to the more intense um, levels of deprivation. Usually when you see a probability density function, it's often accompanied by a cumulative density function on the right. Um, in, the, in the poverty context, I've tried to flip this on the head to make what's called a head count function. So whereas a CDF is usually the probability of the random variable being less than or equal to a particular level, I flip that on its head so that this reads off as the proportion of the population who are classed as poor by each cutoff threshold or each level of the deprivation score. So for example, if we take this first dotted line, which is the 0.2, the value that we've chosen, you see 50% oh, 50 of the population are classed as poor, as we found in this previous, previous summary stat. If you were to choose a more intense, uh, a higher kind of threshold, so if you were in more uh, extreme poverty, we see at the 0.33, that's about 0.20% uh, of the population, and the 0.4 um, is just over 10. So from this function, we can see how um, Poverty about well, headcounts change depending on the deprivation score. And on the left, we see the distribution of deprivation rather than just a summary. Of course, another amazing feature of the MPI is you can decompose this into each of these different dimensions. And what we see here, this is both uncensored, um, which is all refugees, and censored, which is only those who are classed as poor. Generally, what we see in this context is a lot of poverty in, in terms of uh, education in terms of food security, um, is followed by an income resource and living standards and quite low levels in terms of health. Okay, so there's the summary stats for the RMPI. Um, importantly, what we want to do instead of, alongside just showing these stats for the RMPI, is looking at the effect of the ESSN on poverty. So again, the ESSN um, was launched in December 2016. And this was in response to the influx of most of Syrian refugees fleeing to Turkey in the wake of the Syrian civil war. The ESSN is an unconditional cash transfer scheme that provides cash assistance via debit cards 
to over 1.8 million refugees living in Turkey. And beneficiary households of the program receive approximately 155 Turkish lira, which is around 16 euros. They receive this monthly and per family member, in addition to some quarterly top-ups depending on household size. Now, importantly, there are eligibility criteria, these are mainly demographic, which determine if households um, receive um, the SSN or not. This is predominantly based on six criteria. If members in the if the disabled members in the household, if the household heads are single females, single parents or elderly, if there are four or more children in the household, or the dependency ratio is greater than 1.5. So if they meet these eligibility criteria, they with some nuance will receive um, the ESSN. Now, with this, with this eligibility criteria and um, the ability to apply or not, we have these kind of four rough population groups. So the eligible applicants, those who applied and have been told they are eligible for the ESSN and therefore receive it, those who have applied and told they're ineligible, and the non-applicants who decided for whatever reason not to apply, who could be eligible or not, alongside a small group who are, who are pending um, status. Now, if we were to look at differences in the RMPI across these groups, um, we see that the pending and, uh, group and the non-applicants have the highest levels of RMPI, um, and the ineligible applicants have lower levels of RMPI than the eligible applicants. Now, the problem with looking at this data and trying to um, see if there's an effect of the ESSN on RMPI is selection. So these four different groups are made of entirely different people. So some very quick summary stats here. The eligible applicants have much higher um, household size. Non-applicants are much le li less likely to be female-headed. Um, Non-applicants uh, are much more likely to have arrived within the last 12 months. Um, and of course, the, for the eligibility criteria, um, the eligible applicants are much more likely to have this dependency ratio um, we dis have disabled them have a high number of children. So of course we cannot look at these, these um, measures and say that this is the effect of the ESSN, that this has changed poverty in this way. Now ideally what we'd have is a randomized control trial, randomly separating individuals into treated and control groups. We don't have that. Um, the second best would be to look at quasi-experimental designs, so difference and differences, um, or regression discontinuity. And we looked for these and there was, we couldn't find them with the data available. So what we have to rely on is propensity score methods. So we use a particular form of propensity score methods called inverse probability weighted regression adjustment, which I'll try not to say too many times because it's very long. So this is a doubly robust method which combines propensity score methods with a regression adjustment. The aim is to balance control and treated groups across the observable characteristics, which reduces selection bias um, and allows us to estimate causal treatment effects. Into the treatment groups, we're classing the treated as these eligible applicants, and in the control group, we include the ineligible applicants, non-applicants, and those who are pending. So these are all groups who have not received the ESSN, while the eligible applicants have. Now, importantly, for propensity on score methods, you need to control on certain characteristics. So we have household characteristics relating to the region they're in, their arrival date, the number of children, adults, and the number of elderly in the household. We have measured the household head in terms of nationality, age, gender, and profession. And importantly, we also include these ESSN eligibility criteria. So these are measures which a priori we thought were important in terms of um, vulnerability of refugees and is why they got the ESSN in the first place. And it's because we have the non-applicants in the pending in addition to the ineligible applicants that we have um, good basically what's called overlap between these groups. Um, and I won't go into the details on the overlap, but the overlap looks good. And when we use the propensity score weights, we have balanced samples. So the idea behind an inverse probability weight of regression adjustment is that at the first stage, you estimate a propensity score. This looks at the probability of being in a treatment group conditional on 
the observable characteristics you have. So we estimate that using a logic regression. We then use the inverse probability weights um, to form the weights that we'll use in a weighted regression. And this basically gives um, a lower weight to those people who are more likely to be in the group that they're in and a higher weight to those who are less likely to be in the other group. Now, the, the regression adjustment part of this, and so in typical um, inverse probability weighted regressions, uh, methods, sorry, we just use these weights and calculate the differences and means between control and treated group. With a regression adjustment, we're also able to include control variables and the interaction of the control variables with D, the treatment dummy. This basically allows what's called a doubly robust method so that either the weighting has to be correct or the regression um, has to be correct in order for um, the approach to be valid. Um, we get good balance and with some common support, which I won't go into now. Um, but of course, these methods come with the usual caveats about um, the imbalance between unobservable characteristics. So that has to be taken into consideration. So using these methods, and using the RMPI we've calculated, we've created, we can estimate what we call average treatment effects, or particularly in this case, average treatment on the treated. So in all, all the results that I'll show you now, these are the estimated effects of the SSN on the eligible applicants, the treated group. So with the RMPI, we can separate this into different interesting statistics. So the first, we can look at the headcount ratio. Is an individual classed as poor or not, according to certain cutoff thresholds? So 20%, 33 or 40%. We can also look at um, the deprivation score. So this is kind of uncensored um, deprivation. Or we can estimate the RMPI. In terms of the headcount ratio at the 20% threshold, we see that without the SSN, about 67% of eligible applicants would have been classed as poor. The effect of the SSN is large and significant, reducing the, the, proportion of, the proportion of those who are classed as poor by 18 percentage points. So from 0.69 down to 0.51. If we look at a um, higher cutoff threshold of 33.3, this goes from 21.4 uh, down by 10 percentage points. And at the 40% level, this is um, about 17% down by about 0.1. So across all these different cutoff thresholds we can use, we see large and significant effects of the ESSN. We can also look at, um, as I said before, uh, the deprivation score. We see without the ESSN, this was about 0.23. This reduces by minus 0.5. Um, so in effect, that's uh, one indicator within one uh, dimension um, or two in the living standards. Right. The RMPI similarly has a significant reduction from 0.2 down by 0.07. Of course, we can also decompose um, the MPI into um, each dimension. So these are looking at um, each of these dimensions, these are weighted dimensions, which are uncensored. So if the value was zero, it means an individual is, is in education, for example. Um, individuals are not deprived in any education domain. If it's one, they're deprived in both. So we see again, and here we can see where this effect is coming from. So in education, food security and living standards, we see significant and, and negative effects. So there's a reduction in poverty particularly in food security and living standards and also in education, but we don't see any significant effects in health or income. Um, so these results um, are very similar to the, the work that's been done in the previous papers. There's a richness to using an MPI in an impact evaluation that allows you to get at headcount ratios, intensities, and decompositions into different dimensions. But we're trying to go one step further than that. And the first attempt at that is by looking at um, quantile treatment effects. So this is using existing um, data, uh, existing methods and data. Um, and it basically estimates the impact of the SSN 
on the deprivation score at different quantiles of deprivation. So instead of just looking at an, uh, an average treatment effect, which is this dotted line here, we can see how the effect of the ESSN changes for those who are less deprived towards those who are more deprived. And what we see is the ESSN has had a large impact on those who are more deprived, um, reducing the deprivation score to a greater extent. So when we started doing this work, we also um, try to go beyond these methods. Um, and in terms of the potential outcomes framework, which is primarily used um, by Ruben and, and by the exactly as used in these previous analyses, we assume determinism, that the outcome variable that we observe, yi, um, is the potential outcome that an individual would have had had they had the treatment, or the potential outcome an individual would have had if they had not had the treatment. And depending on DI, what we observe, if they're in the treatment group or control group, we would observe a particular YI. What we're doing here is to go beyond that and look at a probabilistic potential outcomes framework. Well, rather than just looking at the level of the outcome, we're looking at a probabilistic function of the outcome. Or in other words, across the whole domain of um, the deprivation score, what is the probability that each individual has each level of that deprivation? And we can do this again for um, treated and controlled groups. So the MPI has a particular functional form and one of the um, particularities is if it's a discrete variable. And so when we started creating this, so in order to find a particular um, probabilistic distribution, um, we're using what's called a beta binomial distribution. So this is flexible and it has two shape parameters, alpha and beta, which determine the shape of a probability density function. So the green, for example, is heavily skewed to the left, the blue, um, a mean value of about 0.5, and the red, heavily skewed up to the right. So the flexibility of the beta distribution allows different parameters, say alpha and beta, to be prescribed, which show um, different probabilities of having different levels of the outcome. So imagine here, this is um, what we showed before in terms of the probability mass of the distribution score. If we could plot a nice function um, which fitted that data, that would be great. Um, and again, we can get a head count function that we saw here on the right hand side by transforming this probability mass into the head count function, as I showed before. Um, now, crucially, a beta binomial has a binomial part, which allows you to have a certain number of trials. So, the way we first looked at this was to look at the number of possible values of deprivation that an individual could have. So from 0 to 1 in um, increments of 0.5, we try to estimate um, the deprivations, the distribution of the deprivation score in the first instance. What we found was that it didn't, that it didn't actually fit very well. So instead, we looked at the marginal distributions of each dimension. Um, and what that allows us to do um, is to aggregate up from these marginal distribution according to education, living standards, et cetera, to get an overall measure um, of deprivation score. Now the way we do this, with this functional form, I'll be very quick on this. This function um, is basically what allows you to plot a probability mass function of a beta binomial. It has shape parameters, alpha i and beta i, which can be specified for each individual according to their characteristics. We estimate the alpha and beta using a weighted maximum likelihood, uh, ma weighted maximum likelihood estimation um, using the weights we've obtained from the um, propensity score weight method. We use a similar regression adjustment in that we include the dummy variables for control and treated, the, con the covariates that we had as the controls and the interaction between these two. But instead um, of just estimating as we did in the first place, um, a weighted regression 
which basically has an error term u and kind of forgets about that and just looks at the expectation in terms of why um, what we do here is have both of these shape parameters alpha and beta, which gives you an entire distribution of the outcome of interest. So we first do this by looking at the marginal distribution in each dimension. Um, and this estimation allows us to do this for each individual, but we can aggregate this up to the whole sample. So for education, for example, there will be three points on the binomial distribution um, where they're deprived in no indicators in either of the one indicators or in both indicators. We can estimate this in a potential outcomes framework for those who, uh, with and without treatment um, for these eligible applicants. So when we do this for education, for example, we find, I'm sorry, the, the, the blue is treated. There's an increase in the probability of being deprived in no dimensions in education um, and a decrease in the probability of being deprived in both. And that's what we're seeing in those average effects on education. We're seeing a reduction in um, death frequency in education because of this reason, because um, of an increase and decrease in the, in the probability of each level. We see this across health, food security, income resources, living standards. And again, these are all reflecting the results that we saw on the average level. What's nice is we can then aggregate at these dimensions into allowing us a score of deprivation. So we can identify the whole probabilistic uh, potential outcomes for across the entire distribution of deprivation for the control and treated. So we see here for low levels of deprivation, the blue, the treated, is above the, the red. So that means that ESSN has caused a reduction in the probability, uh, sorry, it's caused an increase in the probability of uh, eligible applicants having low levels of deprivation. And we see the higher end of deprivation, there's a reduction in the probability from control to treated, showing they're less likely to be deprived and um, have higher levels of deprivation. We can again see this kind of headcount functions that we mentioned before, which kind of aggregates this data and finds that for any level of um, any cutoff threshold, there seems to always have been a reduction in um, the headcount, the number of people classified as poor. Um, we can get the differences out on these, again, as I said before. So this effect is increasing um, the probability of having a low level of deprivation and decreasing the probability of having a high level of deprivation. And then so across a whole uh, distribution of deprivation, there's a reduction in the number of people classified as poor. Okay, so I think I may have rushed a little bit, but hopefully to conclude. So what we did was to create a multidimensional poverty index for refugees, and we estimated the impact of the SSN on multidimensional poverty. We applied and developed nuanced econometric methods, which allow us to go beyond the average and identify the distributional effects on incidence and intensity of poverty. We found that the SSN has significant effects on multidimensional poverty, particularly in the dimensions of food security, education, and living standards. Reductions in the incidence of poverty is found, regardless of the color threshold used, and we find reductions in deprivation are greatest amongst the most deprived. Um, so thank you very much for your time, um, and I really look forward to your discussions and comments. Thank, thank you. you, Matthew. That was uh, indeed most succinct. Um, <clears throat> just a, a great outline as to how you might um, evaluate uh, programs uh, up and down the distribution. I really appreciate your clarity of uh, presentation. Let me turn it over to the discussant, Josephine Pasanen. Josephine. Thank you, James, um, and thank you, uh, Matthew, for an interesting and very engaging presentation. And, uh, and first of all, let me just offer my congratulations to the authors for writing a very compelling and innovative research paper. I truly enjoyed reading it. it. It's been a while since I've been looking at conditional cash transfers and cash transfer programs and so on, and impact evaluations. So this was, this was uh, really refreshing. And I think it makes um, 
well, it makes a very important contribution to sort of the ongoing debates on social protection programs and their design. Uh, it unearths distributional effects, as you alluded to, James, and that's that's always welcome. And uh, so, let me just offer perhaps a couple of initial reflections and and three questions, maybe, to get the conversation starting. And I'm sure that there are several other questions and comments from those listening in. So. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because I think the real value of, of these instances is, is really to spark a, a comprehensive and inclusive conversation, right? So, um, well, first, um, well, cash transfer programs, they're, I mean, they're becoming inte uh, integral parts of social protection programs, especially in, in developing countries. And um, as you alluded to, uh, as you, as you um, note in the paper, uh, even more so in emergency contexts, right? Uh, and certainly Mark might describe to sort of seeming success of, of other previous conditional cash transfer programs, in, not least in middle-income countries in Latin America. So we have evaluations of the Mexican flagship program Progresa showing very positive results on several development dimensions. In Brazil, we had for a long time, the one of the world's largest CCT programs in Bolsa Familia, and although parts of it was discontinued, uh, the current pandemic concerns also seem to to prone the government to to reinstate a version or some versions of this program. And uh, conditionality is often is often in these debates. Then conditionality is often described as sort of a key to create accountability and to make sure that people actually behave in accordance with the intentions of the program so that you achieve all these development outcomes. Uh, and there are obviously normative questions here about trying to steer people's behaviors and, and agency and so on here. And I think this paper does a really good job in showing that conditionality might not be necessary to achieve development outcomes across the board. Um, we also know that conditionality may add to bulkiness and administrative burdens, which can be especially difficult in crisis and emergency situations or in situations such as um, um, the one presented in the paper where, where you're working with refugees, right? So. Perhaps my first question here to Matthew then is, uh, is what your view is on this whole sort of conditionality versus unconditionality debate and, and how you think this, this paper sort of adds to that discussion. Um, and the second um, reflection then is it builds on that. So in fact, sort of the ongoing pandemic has raised a lot of voices for cash transfer programs and relief programs that ensure minimal minimal floors for people. So including the UNDP where I work and their, the call for sort of a universal, a temporary universal basic income, which also highlights the importance of understanding poverty and vulnerability from a multi-dimensional perspective, right? Uh, and I mean, there's this goes beyond calls and pledges. There's there's examples of countries uh, such as Ch as Chile, where they just last year instated an emergency cash transfer program to, with the aim aiming to reach the most vulnerable households that rely on informal income sources who who've been adversely hit by by the pandemic, right? But targeting sort of those most deprived and those that rely on informal informal incomes etc is challenging uh, right and and I'm sure this is certainly an issue in refugee settings so where there's issues of lack of data lack of formal recognitions of IDs uh, other sort of social and cultural barrier barriers that you also uh, allude to a bit in the paper um, and the paper does do a great job in showing distributional effects. And it's, it argues that it's able to capture sort of the, the effects for the most deprived household. And that's, that's a really important contribution. Uh, but you also mentioned that there are 
some find that and you mentioned in the presentation as well, that there's some findings showing that non-applicants and those with pending applications are amongst those most the most poor. So perhaps for my second question, I'd be interested in hearing um, your reflections on this and on target on sort of targeting in general and and perhaps if you think that these measures such as as the one that you're uh, that you're using the the refugee, uh, the RFMPI, um, if they can actually help uh, in terms of targeting and reaching reaching those uh, those most most in need. And then um, finally, I guess I, I wouldn't make my sort of impact evaluation background justice without uh, with just making a note or a question about sort of treatment and control, but then going into a broader uh, reflection, uh, which I think is more interesting, really, in terms of perhaps agency and and empowerment. So, so the per paper argues or shows, you know, there's balance in terms of vulnerability between treatment and control groups here, and it does a really good job in doing so. Um, uh, but then it uses non-applicants and pending applicants and in control. So. I'm wondering if if you've had any reflections around sort of other non-observable differences between the groups that as people self-select into applying. Uh, I mean, I men you mentioned that everyone gets information about eligibility. So uh, I'm wondering perhaps, and this, it might be a bit of a stretch, but sort of if there's issues of, of agency and, and, and the empowerment playing a role here um, in terms of actually make, taking the step to, to apply and participate. And if that also sort of reflects in, in outcomes. And, um, and finally, sort of on the flip side, what, what your thoughts are on the contribution of these types of sort of cash transfer programs are on on enhancing agency and, and empowerment amongst refugees. But all in all, very interesting paper and I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And Matthew, you have actually another full paper to present now and answer uh, in reply to the discussant. So please <laughs> Always uh, more start. research needed. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And just to remind the rest of you, I put a note in the uh, chat, please uh, throw a couple of questions in the Q&A uh, soon, otherwise you'll be stuck with questions from me. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, thank you very much. So you, I think you've addressed the parts of the paper that I'm most uncomfortable with because I'm the, I do the econometrics, the treatment effects, so this is great. Um, so I think the first question was my view on conditionality versus unconditionality. Um, so I think this paper, although this paper shows the, that the effects of the unconditional cash transfer work in all of these different dimensions and on the intensity of poverty, we don't compare the two. So what, what we can't know from this is if the conditional cash transfer would have had more effect than the unconditional one would. And uh, yeah, the typical Economists have on, we have a limited and finite set of resources. Um, so I, I, I don't think this paper itself can speak much to which is better in terms of conditionality um, versus unconditional. Um, but I think it's great that it shows this unconditional cash transfer program does work. I think the other part, um, which our, our colleagues at World Food Program um, tell, keep telling us about is what's important is that this is in a, a wider um, range of other programs going on at the same time. So there is there is a specific educational conditional cash transfer which is going on. Um, so, and I think the way um, I mean framing the debate is to say, okay, look, this unconditional cash transfer is is one amongst um, a kind of an ecosystem of different programs that are available. So um, that that might be important in in thinking about. It doesn't have to be either conditional or unconditional. Maybe these can work together um, to actually um, do what we want them to do is improve, uh, decrease poverty um, in, in particular dimensions. 
does that does that answer the question in a way of <laughs> oh yeah definitely i think there's probably not there's not probably not one single answer here as you say it's context specific and i think it's interesting to hear that there's this is one program within a broader ecosystem of, of programs so that probably helps uh but it's uh it's just a very interesting ongoing debate in terms of universal basic income and and unconditionality versus conditionality and yeah. and to a certain extent i think the unconditionality of it but that's sort of segues i guess into the final question um might at least my sense is that is is that it might push or enhance sort of the agency um agency part of of these types of programs mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. so when you get into that question of course i i'll just chime in a second here um actually much of the uh conditionality discussion uh, the income part at least in traditional conditional cash transfer programs was designed to create agency by removing a barrier so whether or not you're advancing agency depends on i suppose how you are looking at it and the original construction of let's say progresso it was done in that sense to begin with um i i just in general had a had a question myself in terms of uh, the variables that seemed to show change and those that didn't one of my great questions always is, um, you know, you've you've constructed an MPI. MPIs are often criticized. They look at them and say, well, these variables, do they really change? Or is this something that's long term? And here you're talking about humanitarian crisis that's going on. These are refugees. That, so could you just have a bit of a discussion on the long run or short run nature of the variables in your refugee MPI and try to link them to your outcome your results if you will i'm not speaking great so i can share this screen to help me cheat as an appendix so what we've also done this by each indicator so these are the the same um, average treatment effects of the treated we have the education indicators health food security income resources and living standards uh, a reduction is good um, zero nothing positive bad in terms of education so we have two variables so and this is kind of what i think we would expect for this is absence from school for children there's a large and significant effect for the education of the parents no change and i think that this speaks exactly to this this debate on sticky versus fluid kind of variables by giving this cash transfer, you know, it might prevent children having to go to work for the family and able to go to school and not be able to be absent. But in the short run, in this, it's probably not going to immediately improve um, adult education. In terms of health, there's no significant effect on uh, the number of those who are ill, but there's a slightly significant effect on those who are able to get treatment. So there is a bit of movement in that health variable there. Food security, both of these are large and significantly different. And I think this is, again, what we'd expect. We'd expect there to be um, this to respond quite rapidly. Income resources. So there's no effect on precarious work. Slight reduction, but not significant. But actually, what we see, there is an increase on individuals uh, not working in the household. And one of the reasons for this is there is um it's not a basically condition of not working in so not precisely but there's a condition alongside that in addition to that so what we're seeing here is perhaps the ssn is somewhat increasing um the likelihood of people choosing not to work or, or not working in order to get the ssn um some of living standards again all of these are negative and almost significant but the largest is wash which i think is winter acids if i remember correctly um what should be i can't see because of the um, 
chat. But yeah, winter assets. Um, so yeah, so this this uh, this is this links to the debate we're trying to have at the start in terms of programmatic versus population. I think if you really wanted to data mine, I think you could create a particular programmatic MPI which showed effect. Um, or you know you, you could entirely choose variables which you didn't expect to change and show no effect of a program uh, of uh, an intervention. So a lot of the debates we were having is on the importance of what we did, and I think we almost did it inadvertently, is to create a population MPI for refugees before we did the impact evaluation. Mm. Um, and really, what we should have done is had a pre-analysis plan. You know, lock that away and sealed it, and I think that would be good practice for others. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's an interesting debate on which variables are going to respond, and, and therefore which should be included on that. Well, I'll just go one step further and echo what Samuel McQuillan is asking in the Q and A. Um, okay. Starting out by saying thank you very much for your presentation. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the RMPI was constructed? indicator selection, weights, et cetera, the usual. Were there any data limitations that you had to navigate that, uh, you know, as you reflect back on it, uh, that um, you can tell us about? Yeah, so fr Frank is the expert on this because Frank was the one who developed this. So if, if Frank pipe up, if I'm saying something wrong, um, he's much more in depth on this. Um, yeah, there were certain data limitations which led to um, the variables that we selected. Um, I think um, we had five trial MPIs that we started with. We went through and did five alternative ones. Um, we did all the standard tests and the redundancy analysis, um, et cetera, in order to get down to uh, this, this final structure that we had. Um, particular variables we didn't have, I think, were stuff like BMI and stunting for the health, um, and it's ju it just the nature of the, the type of questionnaire that we asked for. So I think an important thing is this, this is not particularly, we're not saying this is a refugee MPI to use in all contexts. Um, it was It's honed for the refugee context in Turkey, which again, it's not particularly camp-based. Most refugees that live um, in, in housing across Turkey, um, so which is very different from, say, um, the camps from South Sudan and Northern Uganda. Um, and we also have data limitations, and we've only focused on one data set. So uh, a nice extension to this kind of work would be to maybe have, I don't know if that would be appropriate, but kind of like a global refugee population, uh, refugee or also poverty index. But it's not something we were able to do. Yes, hello. Just if I could maybe switch in, Frank Formi is speaking, uh, just to maybe jump in there. We used the CVME data, which was a poverty and vulner vulnerability survey that ranged from seven days to 30 days to three months and then longer term. And um, so we have different recall periods. And in that sense, if food security is more weak based, uh, whereas health is um, the last 30 days. Um, when it comes to, uh, to education, it's the last semester, and then we have more longer term indicators in the living standards uh, uh, dimension. Um, we were limited in terms of data when it came to important indicators for refugees, such as access to water, which we were not able to construct, um, the highest education of the uh, of the household head and the second household head was a con was only been done because we couldn't construct a use of schooling indicator. Uh, and I could name a few more. So what we do in the paper is to highlight um, those limitations um, quite clearly or we, and we try to, uh, to, to steer the debate towards um, maybe possible uh, better data collection uh, also in other cases. But um, so th some of these um, have different uh, um, kind of yeah timings and that that is just the nature I think as well in terms of the a refugee context versus a, a poverty context and other programs but we try to make that point quite clearly in the paper thank you thank you so much really um, now from Emre Kuchekia uh, thanks Matthew for the presentation and congrats for study uh, for the study I was going to ask your um, findings have experienced any changes from year to year. And the reason is due to the fact the exchange rate of 
Turkish lira has been quite volatile. So has that caused you any problems in interpreting valid results? Yeah, so to give a bit of context for the paper, so the, the paper was off the back of a, a larger report that we did, which we think should hopefully be out in February. Um, and in that paper, there's much more analysis on on the effect of the inflation, um, uh, minimum, minimum expenditure taxes, et cetera, which goes into a lot more detail there. Um, I think the analysis we did then, it looked like multidimensional poverty fell across the years, um, but there wasn't a huge amount of difference in the, or no significant difference in the effect of the ESSN on, um, in each of these waves. So um, we didn't come to, we didn't do that as kind of a heterogeneous analysis there. Um, so there were not, yeah, not particularly significant differences. Um, but as you say, the inflation has been quite an issue in terms of reducing the purchasing power that this uh, nominal uh, rate had. I think one of the, um, there were top ups that were introduced a bit later for families with a larger number of um, uh, larger family members that were quarterly. And again, our, our co-authors at World Food Programme uh, can probably answer this better than me. Um, but again, that was an attempt to uh, reduce the impact of the inflation it had. And I think even now the inflation is, is quite high in Turkey. So um, yeah, it's getting worse and worse at that. Great, well, thank you. And uh, I know that Jacob has a question. Uh, you can just unmute yourself and, and read it off yourself, if you don't mind, Jake. Sure, thanks, James. And, and thanks, Matt, for the presentation. Um, great to, to see the, the paper presented. I've read previous drafts, uh, and each time I learned something new, so that's great. My question is, is mainly on the um, rationale of the PSM uh, that you performed. And uh, I was just curious, because part of the of the literature on, on PSM would probably advocate for separate um, PSMs for each Y that you have, basically. And now that we, we have quite a few, uh, including all the, the dimensions and the, uh, the indicators of an MPI, for example, could you elaborate a bit on your take on the pros and cons of just doing one PSM for, for all Y instead of doing separate ones? Um, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, do you mean that you would um, use different control variables for to construct each S, each PSM, or would you use the same but run it separately in each case? Yeah, I meant um, you you might choose different ones because they um, might vary depending on which why. <clears throat> sorry, which why you're you're currently looking at which set of controls might be appropriate. So some of the controls are inappropriate for uh, the entire set, obviously, because they might be related to some individual indicators. Uh, but then when you would run it for individual indicators, they might be relevant again. And you might have a better PSM for, for some particular wise then, um, rather than having a, a more reduced set because you want to have a one size fits all solution, basically which is obviously easier, but uh, might have some. So yeah, I was just wondering what your take was on, on the pros and cons of that. Yeah, so I, th um, I think we tried to have control variables in there, which weren't directly related to the outcome, I think. Or, you know, so, so it, we wouldn't need to change the variables um, for different Ys. I think the usual way to, evaluate how um, the rigor of a PSM model, you shouldn't look at the outcomes, I don't think. So I don't know, maybe if you can refer me to this literature, I can take a read, that would be good. Um, but as I understood, you um, almost do the PSM matching without looking at the outcome variable. Because one of the reasons for pre-specifying that before looking at the effect is that you could keep tweaking your control variables in order to get an effect out. Um, in terms of uh, sensitivity, we did some analysis on different types of this. So the average treatment effect on the treated, the ATE. Um, partially, Josephine, related to your question, we included only applicants only. So we excluded the non-applicants and the others 
um, we, we, in one case, we use no sample weights and another unweighted. Uh, and I don't have the other sensitivity, but we, we use different types of PSM models and the results kind of always seem to be similar. Um, so yeah, so yeah, thanks Jacob. If you can send me those papers, that'd be great. I can take a look. Um, but I think you shouldn't need to change them for your outcome variable, as long as the samples are matched based on their characteristics. It would be the same as doing an RCT. These individuals vary in all aspects apart from your, um, your treatment indicator. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll send a few uh, papers and then maybe we can discuss it separately. Thanks. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So let me pull one out of the uh, Q&A. Uh, is it possible that the population that is not supported by the cash transfer program would be affected by the program anyway, just because they're all close together? Um, well, that may or may not be the case. And how can you account for any external impact of that sort? And could you just elaborate a little bit more on the structure of, of the case here? Because most of the time when you think of refugees, uh, you think of a group that's all together next to one another. But in Turkey, with this program, life is rather different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it's, I, th I think the important thing for this context is it's not a refugee camp. Um, individuals are spread out across. So we have one of these beautiful maps by Frank. So these are, for example, the RMPIs across uh, the whole of Turkey. So as you can see, mm. um, refugees are spread and housed across Turkey. Um, so we wouldn't expect the typical spillover effects, I think that you're thinking in a particular camp environment um, because the population is much more dispersed. Um, so I, I think there are, yeah, there are less concerns about that um, than, than there would be in other settings. Um, all right, it's great. Thanks for Matthew, explaining sorry. that. Oh, sorry, James. Go <laughs> Matthew, ahead. You'll maybe see. just to to follow up on that, Matthew. So, what are your thoughts in terms of knowing the context in terms of self selection into the program and and sort of um, if people have the information that they would that they are eligible they have the eligibility information right so why would eligible applicants not apply and and uh, even though you know there is an argument made in the paper that the groups are are balanced right in terms of vulnerability do you have any thoughts in terms of of differences between between the two groups in that sense yeah so i think in terms of Demographics. So this this is kind of the demographic table of the differences. Um, I think the thing which stuck out to us most about the non-applicants um, is that the ma the majority have arrived more recently. So if you look at the eligible applicants, sixty six percent have been there for three to six years, whereas over fifty percent of the non-applicants have arrived within the first three years and. 23% of those in the last 12 months. Um, so, so part of this might be a, a timing thing, that it, it, those, it's those refugees have arrived more recently and don't have the information, well, don't probably have the information yet and have acted on it. Um, but you know, th there, could, there could be other reasons why people are choosing not to apply. Um, Right, right. Of course, and that's and that's hard to know. And then perhaps uh, following up. So, if people who are participating or tend to have been there longer time than a longer period of time, then they might also have a better sense of sort of the social institutional frameworks and and opportunities that are out there and are able to perhaps even make better use of the cash transfers and translating it into productive sort of outcomes for themselves and for their households. So that might also be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As you also end, end the paper with looking at sort of future, future avenues for research. 
Yeah. And, and, and I think this kind of also relates a bit to um, your previous question on targeting as well. Right. Um, so our co-authors and Frank are doing, an, and Jacob are doing another paper specifically on targeting. So looking to see how you could use uh, the RMPI in a targeting metric. And um, I'm not very familiar with all the details of that, but um, I think it, a lot of it is this kind of conflict you say between um, simplicity information and being able to go and apply data collection, all this kind of stuff at the point in which you target a particular population. The more nuanced the, um, the targeting criteria, the more expensive and the more money you have to spend for information to allow people to be informed. And what, one of the parts about the report that we said is actually amongst those who've arrived very recently, they often have the highest levels of multidimensional poverty. So something that might be important to do is to try and uh, get to those individuals uh, sooner and provide assistance to those who have arrived recently. Right. And one question I had on the on the program, just for curiosity, is there any sort of time limits in terms of how long you can be in the program? Because as you're a refugee for a certain period of time, although we know people tend to have the status longer and longer as situations aren't resolved, but I uh, was just wondering if that's if that's something that's taken into account. Unless I'm wrong, I think we have a, uh, I think Birchin's on the call. I, I think um, there's not particularly a time limit. Um, I think employment is one of the, um, one of these, I think if you get employment, then often the SSM is taken away. Um, so I think a lot of their work was looking at kind of a, a graduation strategy as well and trying to, um, um, yeah, try and ensure that refugees who uh, kind of got into a stable footing, you know, get out of poverty, were then able to go into employment and no longer need the SSM. So I think that was some of the work that they were trying to do then. Um, yeah, but I think with the with the data we have, we, we can't look at alternative systems. So I think we, we have to rely on the impact evaluation of what we have. And, you know, I think either further evidence will be needed to look into that or, yeah. Right. Well, that makes for many future research projects though. <laughs> Great. Well, um, we had a couple more questions there. It's now deadline time to stop, but let me just go ahead and see if I can summarize and then have one final word. Um, to partially respond to Emery's question, uh, the transfer value and top up, this is Basak Dogan. So the uh, transfer value and top up assistance has been increased over time to compensate for the decrease in the purchasing power of the beneficiaries driven by the high inflation rates, as you rightly mentioned. So just to clarify by that, and I think that we were um, not having the ability to mute, unmute. So. Um, and then finally, we had one last question, which was, what do you think the weaknesses of the RMPI to evaluate the sex success of the ESSN program? And I'll, I'll just go one, one step further. I mean, it really is, uh, I'm thinking <clears throat> once again of the context. And, you know, when you have refugees integrated in a population, many other influences become super important in the success or failure of the individuals in question. Could it be that those are, are you know, something that you should study and that should be part of the setup in future discussions? Because I would expect networks would loom very large in Turkey for, uh, for this. I, I don't know, after a while, if a population has been there for quite a long time, networks should start to become more and more important. So last comments, um, go ahead. Yeah, again, great difficult questions. Um, I think some of the data that was in there was on things like social cohesion. So I think, um, yeah, it's an interesting, is network, if we're in the kind of capabilities framework, is networking a capabilities? It's in, I don't know. Is it, maybe yeah, it is? We, yeah. we call it uh, networking is external capabilities. If you look at my paper, um, many years ago, uh, mm. which you can see in many 
citations, uh, external capabilities in my world referred to those sorts of capabilities you receive because you are friends or have networks with other people having those capabilities. Mm -hmm. So if someone can read, you then have the capability to read at least some share of it. At least if you have uh, a piece of paper, you can walk over to your friend's house and let that person read. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the concept that goes on here. And it extends to almost every part of your being and almost any capability to a greater or less ex uh, extent. Yeah, and, and I think this network data is, if we can figure out a way to gather it and get it into more surveys, it's a fantastic use of, um, yeah, I think it'd be incredibly interesting to include and, as you say, particularly important in these contexts. Um, would think so. Any case, I should probably uh, wind it down now. Uh, any final statements by our two people on panel uh, or anyone else who's just wanting to open up their mouths and haven't uh, till now? Great, well, it looks like everyone's uh, ready to move on. Uh, thank you so much for being here, audience. Uh, panelists, please click on that little um, thing in the chat box, if you would, to go over to the post-event discussion. Thank you very much once again, and we'll see you some other time on the Multidimensional Poverty Index um, event. Take care, bye. <laughs>